to be like a science teacher? Um, I guess that's kind of what I do in a, in a sense, yeah. you know. But yeah, I enjoy science and I enjoy trying to find ways to um, make it more accessible to people, mm. make it more interesting. Because I mean the core of most science is actually very interesting stuff, it's just that it's, it's armored with this language and stuff, you know, that keeps most people, you know, out of it, you know. And you know, in general most subjects are like that, they kind of come up, with, even in university settings, they wall off geology from biology, from chemistry, from physics. When in fact, there are a lot of really interesting stuff between the different subjects. You know, and each field has its own kind of language. <laughs> Just we use things like that to start. You know, we have other tools that can kind of add water more incrementally. Whoa, that's way too fast. And then we have you know tools for modifying the surface. So you basically can kind of sculpt whatever you want um, using the UFO. So this is actually a raised land tool. Um, so you're raising the land right there. To yeah. Form it. And now we're getting an atmosphere starting to form as the water is evaporating out. But this one's going to be kind of hot. But so I could you know kind of build a colony there eventually once I terraform it. You know, I'd want to start bringing in animals and things. Uh, here's a world that's already got wildlife living on it, um, but no civilization. Oh, we have no imposter either, so the graphics aren't correct there. Some of the worlds are going to be realistic. Is this one that's been generated or one that you went and handled? This is one that was generated. Okay. Um, so we have a wide variety of uh, algorithms that will generate very different looking planets. You know, some very you know realistic, some a bit more kind of fantastic like this one. It depends on what level the planet's at. If it's a wild planet like this, um, I might be using it to collect specimens, you know, that I can use to then populate other planets, uh, or even trade with alien races. Uh, I might be um, playing the uplift game, you know, where I can actually use a monolith to make some of these guys intelligent eventually. Do you actually have a monolith? Uh, you yeah. So I can abduct this guy and now he'll go to my cargo bay. I can use him, you know, for, you know, breed stock in another world, or, you know, plants or whatever. Uh, so one of the special things that we can, in fact, get is the monolith, you know, that we can use to then, uh, but right now it's, it's a little too big. <laughs> but it, it still works. But you basically use that with a certain species and then come back, you know, many hours later and see what civilization they've built. So when I come back, it'll basically make one of the species on this planet intelligent. And then when I come back to this planet, there'll be cities and vehicles and all this that species is built. And so um, at that point, they'll probably be worshipping me too. So if I encounter kind of like a tribal planet, I can actually get them to worship me, you know, by doing things that have kind of amazed them. Uh, and which has, you know, impacts later in the game. You know, if these guys worship me, then they're like kind of a very strong colony. But this is just my home system. If I pull back to the interstellar, um, so this is interstellar space. Um, so the galaxy is actually quite large. I mean, this is several hundred stars in this region, but it's a pretty small region of the entire galaxy. I think the idea that you've got this, you know, basically a little toy universe inside of your computer is vastly appealing to me. There's an entire universe there, possibilities to explore, stories to tell, games to play. One of so. my favorite things in The Sims was to just let it run all night and just see what happened when I woke up in the morning. Yeah. And I imagine something like Now you've got a million other people doing it for you as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and you can visit a world and then come back, you know, many hours later and see what sort of civilization they've developed. Yeah, tell, tell us more, maybe explain a little bit more about the, you know, being able to upload and download content from other players. Well, that happens automatically. So what's happening is the game is building a model of each player. Their aesthetic, their play style, their skill levels. And based upon that, deciding what content to populate your world with. And it depends on what level of the game you're at. So if you're at the creature level, 
uh, is populating you know your game with other creatures that other players have made. If you're at the let's say the city or civilization level, it's populating your world with uh, other cities, vehicles, buildings that other players have made um, to give you good competitors. What about taking sport to be a little bit more um, aggressively, say, multiplayer, so that people could actually simultaneously... I mean, does that appeal to you at all, simultaneous interaction? I think in some place we might go. I feel like it's a territory that's been explored by so many people, and I'm much more interested in the asynchronous kind of massively single-player thing that we're doing with sport, just because it's something I've never seen before. And we're trying to get the best aspects of multiplayer, which is the collaborative, everybody building this huge world together, without all the downsides, that we all have to be on the same timeline, and that everybody has to be nerfed, and nobody can be the hero. You know, I really want to be the hero in this universe, mm -hmm. and be able to build my galactic federation and conquer all that would oppose me. Uh, and at the same time, I don't want to be coming to all these planets, you know, that are basically offline because the player is not online, you know. And so, I, you know, 95% of the planets will be closed, you know. <laughs> so multiplayer games have a lot of inherent limitations that um, I'm interested in exploring a way to get the benefit without the limitations. In some sense, it's about stepping back and getting a sense of, you know, all the different things the universe is made of at all the different scales. And so, even though we treat it very playfully, I mean, you know, the rough idea that, you know, you have planets and that they can form life with the right conditions and that life kind of evolves and can become intelligent. And the kind of very rough uh, thing about both the entire, you know, history of life and the possible future of life is a perspective that we very rarely get. You know, we're usually stuck at one little moment in time. And so it's not just scales of space, but it's also scales of time. And stepping way back and saying, you know, what does life potentially mean in regards to the overall universe?